the great physician. I ask this morning you to lay hands on him, Lord, and heal his body. Make him whole, Lord. Dissolve these blood clots and let him be released earlier than expected from the hospital with a good prognosis. And let it be a testimony of your faithfulness and your power at work in the child of God that he is. And Lord, we pray for our pastor and Mike as they're making their way to Kiev. Lord, preparing to fly home to us. Lord, pray that whatever the car problems are, you put a good tailwind behind them and get them there the rest of the way. We want to make sure they make their flight and their travels are safe. And Lord, you bring them home to us soon. We are so excited to have them come home, share with us all of the great things that God they've seen you do as a part of this opportunity for ministry that you you gave them. And Lord, we uh, we recognize, God, that it's not just us and what we do that is the kingdom of God, that there's other things happening around the world and even in our own community. And Lord, so with that in mind, we pray for Pastor Ken Andrus and the First Congregational Church, Lord. That God, you would be with them, and especially this morning as your word is declared, that it would breathe life into the work that you are doing through that body of believers, that we would see the kingdom grow and people come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ because of what you are doing. And Lord, we pray for our Panama Campus Church, uh, the Nikas Campus this morning, Lord. God, all the challenges they face as they work so diligently to impact their community and their region and their country. And so, God, we pray that you would just pour out your spirit upon them this morning as your word is declared, as that body of believers gathers together. And, Lord, let your kingdom be at work in them and through them, Lord. And God, we pray this morning for Pastor Sonia and Jose. Lord, your hand be upon them. Provide for their physical needs, we pray, Lord. Keep them safe and secure. Now we think about our missionaries, uh, Richard and Ken Baker with Youth Alive, and the McKinleys, who, Lord, we had the blessing of them being here recently, missionaries to Lithuania. God, we pray that you would just uh, minister to them this morning. Missionaries have so many different needs. Uh, so often we hear about the financial needs they have, Lord, but we know there are others. God, we pray you'd meet them at every place of need that they have. God, that you're, by the power of your spirit, you would open doors of opportunity for them. And that, God, you would give them the strength and the understanding to step through those doors and, and do the ministry that you've given them the chance to accomplish. God, we pray for our church family. Lord, this morning we pray for Sharon Brand. What a blessing she is on our church family. God, we pray you would just minister to her in a special way this week. Bless her. Pour out your spirit upon her. In Jesus' name. And God, we pray for Garrett and Annie Forsberg, Lord, and Eliana. God, we pray, pray in Jesus' name. And she would bless this young family. Lord, you would minister to them. Show up in a special way for them this week. In Jesus' name we pray. And now, Lord, we continue our service and we worship you. Have your way in this place. Have your way in our hearts. In Jesus' precious holy name. And everybody said,
take a few moments in service this morning to pray for those who have needs. I'm going to ask the deacons and uh, others that we've spoken to if you'll come on up and get prepared. And while they do, I want to give you the, the scriptural background for it. Uh, why are we anointing people with oil? Well, it's because the Bible says so. In James chapter 5, picking up at verse 13, it says, If any among you is in trouble, let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Is any among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. And by way of illustration, James goes on to say in verse 17, Elijah was a human being, even as we are. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain the land on the land for three and a half years. Again he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. Why do we pray so much? Because prayer changes things. As our worship team continues, if you would like prayer this morning, please come and let us pray for you.
pleasure here and answer prayer. And I, I know, Lord, you've heard our prayers this morning and have already begun to answer. God, we thank you. You are so faithful, God. God, help us this morning to focus in on you and trust what you have for us. As we come with glad hearts, in Jesus' name, amen and amen. You may be seated this morning. Uh, just a couple of uh, very important announcements this morning. Uh, first of all, I'm wearing my Let It Snow tie. I thought that was important, so I shared that with you. You're not getting a smile out there. there no, we do have a couple of items in the bulletin I want to call to your attention. There's a Thanksgiving meal that is being uh, sponsored by the Ministerial Association, and that information is in your bulletin. Also, we have uh, the, cake, uh, the, the cookie giveaway uh, this year. How many of you like cookies? I like cookies. They taste great. I like to eat them. I, I don't know if I'm any good at making them, but I do like to eat them. And uh, we like to bless our community, and that opportunity is coming up on December 6th and 7th. If you are a person that bakes, want to give this a try, want to bake some cookies, a couple of dozen, different kinds, whatever, uh, please take a moment and sign up on the sheet out in the foyer. Uh, and if you have any uh, questions uh, or you're able to be involved in any way in the delivery or you know putting the trays together, I understand that's a little bit of work, but when it's cookies, it's easy, right? Cookies are easy to eat, so we're going to do cookies, right? If you have questions, you got to talk to Caroline Bellman because she is a cookie queen, and her number is in the bulletin. And uh, so if you could be involved in that, please, uh, don't hesitate to get involved. And then finally, we have our church family Christmas dinner coming up, and uh, RSVP uh, would be appreciated. Information is in the bulletin if you want to take a look at that. And with that, we are going to go ahead and dismiss our kids to Jericho Kids Church and want the Kids Church. And they're going to have a great time. And we're going to have a great time. I uh, was talking with someone at the start of the service and we were talking. He said, well, you're preaching today. I said, yeah. I said, we got all that cold wind out there. I'm going to bring the hot air. <laughs> Well, as we get started this morning, I just have a, a quick video I want you to, to, to watch with me. Mmm, peanut butter. Mmm, chocolate. <laughs> you got peanut butter on my chocolate. Well, you got chocolate in my peanut butter. Two great days that taste great together. Reese's Peanut Butter Cup. Reese's Milk Chocolate. Good old-fashioned peanut butter. Reese's Peanut Butter Cup. 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 I remember these commercials when I was a kid. How many of you guys remember those commercials? They're great. Okay, now it's time for truth. How many of you, when you were a kid, would take a jar of peanut butter and just eat it? Still do. <laughs> Still do. Okay, a little too much for you. <laughs> uh, you got chocolate on my peanut butter. You got peanut butter on my chocolate. Two great tastes that go great together. Well, we all know things that are great to together. I, for one, for some strange reason, think mostly of food. Like bacon and eggs. Macaroni and cheese, spaghetti and meatballs. Anybody thinking about lunch yet? <laughs> Ice cream and cake, coffee and, yes. well, everything. <laughs> They tell me this is enough to share, but I haven't found that to be true yet. <laughs> um, they have them in different shapes. It's, it's coming up on Christmas time, and they have them in the shape of Christmas trees. 
And I even saw some in the shape of footballs for football season. And uh, I got a special one here. It's in the, even though we didn't get snow today, it's in the shape of, shape of a snowman. And whoever's birthday is closest to today, you get to take this home. But, uh, you know, I have a marketing idea. They need to make it in the shape of broccoli, cauliflower, carrots. Then it'll go over like gangbusters. There are things that just go good together. And that is how we are to be with God. We just go together. We just fit. God has created us for relationship with him. It isn't some accident, it's by design. And we find in scripture that if we draw near to God, he draws near to us. I should use a mic, maybe. This is because he is close. And he wants us to be close to him. So we're turning to Acts this morning to examine this. And our text is found in Acts chapter 17. You want to go ahead and find it? Acts chapter 17. We're going to start at verse number 16. And it'll be on the screen. But if you uh, have it in your Bible and something sticks out at you, you might want to underline it or something. And so there you go, Acts chapter 17, starting at verse number 16. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and God-fearing Greeks, as well as in the marketplace day by day, and those who happened to be there. A group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to debate with him. Some of them asked, what is this babbler trying to say? Others remarked, he seems to be advocating foreign gods. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. Then they took him and brought him to a meeting of the Areopagus, where they said to him, may we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting. You're bringing some strange ideas to our ears, and we would like to know what they mean. All the Athenians and foreigners who lived there spent their time doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest ideas. That was in Athens. We just turn on the news now. Picking up in verse 22. Paul then stood up in a meeting of the Areopagus and said, People of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around to look carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, to an unknown God. So, you are ignorant of the very thing you worship. And this is what I am going to proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth. He does not live in temples built by human hands. And he is not served by human hands, as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. From one man he made all the nations, so that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and their boundaries of the land. God did this so they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him though he is not far from any one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. And some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. Therefore, since we are God's offering, excuse me, offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by human design and skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. 
When they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some of them sneered. But others said, we want to hear, what, uh, hear you again on this subject. At that, Paul left the council. Some of the people became followers of Paul and believed. Among them was Dionysus, a member of the Areopagus, also a woman named Damaris, and a number of others. Father, this morning, I pray that your Holy Spirit would just be at work in your word and in the hearts of your people. And God, that this would not just be another exercise in understanding and uh, understanding a little more, having a little more knowledge, but God, this would be a time of transformation as you touch our hearts. By the power of your word and your spirit, you would change us to that which you would have us be. God, I pray your name. Help me in, from time to my silliness to get out of the way. That your word can be clear. In Jesus' name. Amen. So. After being chased out of Thessalonica and Berea for preaching the good news about Jesus, uh, the Apostle Paul spent a few days in the city of Athens. I'm not really sure what Athens is like today. Nobody's traveling anymore. But uh, as I understand it, in that time, it was a favorite place for philosophers and debaters to hang out. The city also had lots of temples, altars, and statues where people worship whatever God they thought would bring them the most favor or fortune. Paul began talking with people in downtown Athens and in the synagogue, telling them the good news about Jesus. They saw that he was a Jew who served the God of the Old Testament, Yahweh. The idolatry in the city really bothered Paul because that is one of the primary sins that caused Israel to go into captivity. However, Paul began to talk about his life-changing encounter with Jesus. This Jesus had been executed publicly, but then came back to life. Even the uh, superstitious Athenians, the, uh, the claim uh, of someone coming back to life from the dead was difficult to comprehend. Paul attracts enough attention that they finally ask him to come and speak his beliefs to a large group of them. And I'd like to look at what Paul said on that day and talked about. And one of the most important truths of that day was this. God is close. But he wants to be closer. He wants to be closer. If that's all you remember from what I say today, that's a great place to start. God is close to each one of us. But not as close as he wants to be. And that's the main theme of today. God wants to, you to get close to him if you're willing. How do we know that God wants to be close to us and to all people? Well, the Bible reveals a personal God who wants nothing more than to be close to those who will reach out to him. You see, if we draw near to him, he will draw near to us. So let's uncover a few principles that will help us draw closer to the one true God. First of all, I, I, I'd like to take a look at verse 16 to 22 to set up the verse, or set up the sermon uh, Paul was going to give to those in Athens. So while Paul was waiting, verse 16, while Paul was waiting for them, Silas and Timothy, that's who he was waiting for, in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was called right. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the God-fearing Greeks, as well as in the marketplace day by day, those that happened to be there. And a group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to dispute with him. Some of them asked, what is this babbler trying to say? And others remarked, he seems to be advocating for gods. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. 
So then they uh, took him and brought him to a meeting of the Areopagus, where they said to him, May we know this new teaching that you are presenting. You're bringing some strange ideas to our ears. We want to know what they mean. Because all the Athenians and foreigners who lived there spent their time doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest ideas. So this is where we begin this morning. God wants to get close to you, close, wants you to get close to him if you are willing. But getting close to God requires more than just religion. In verse 22, we see Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I see that in every way you are religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with the inscription to an unknown God. So, a person might be very religious, but never really come close to God. See, religion can serve many agendas. Some use religion as therapy to make them feel good about themselves. Some use it to make money so they can worship their real God, mammon, or wealth. Some use religion for the power or influence they might gain from it. Simon the sorcerer was guilty of this. He wanted more control over people, so he tried to buy the gift of the Holy Spirit. People have murdered others in the name of religion, either thinking they were doing God a favor or simply eliminating the competition. The point is this, religion alone will not save you. Christianity is not about religion. It's about relationship with God through Jesus. Religion is about doing whatever makes a person worthy to be accepted by God. All man-made religions fall short of that. Only right relationship with God through Jesus Christ is what makes us acceptable to God. Religion does not take away sin. Faith in Jesus Christ does. If God remains unknown to you, and in Athens they had an altar to the unknown God, then you're missing what you were created for. We might be religious, but God wants us to know him and worship him out of love and gratitude. He loved us first, and his love is what makes us able to love back. So my question this morning is, are you worshiping an unknown God? Or do you know him? Is he a simply a force to reckon with? Or do you really want to know him? Well, being religious is not enough to get us close to God. So our next point shows us that we need to know the truth about who God is to get to know him. So let's look at what God is really like as spoken by Paul to these men in Athens. Because getting close to God requires believing the truth about Him. Now what, we, what you worship as something unknown, I'm going to claim to you, Paul says. And here's an overview of what the passage says about God. First of all, He created everything. Nothing you see, nothing you smell, Nothing you hear, nothing you touch. God created everything. Nothing exists without Him. Whatever forms of microevolution might exist, the raw materials all came from God. If things started out with a mass of swirling gases, 
What was the source of those gases? Where did they come from? God created this world and all that is in it. Then he created man in his own image. Man fell away from God through disobedience, but God provided a way for that relationship to be fixed. God the Creator longs to see man, the high point of his creation, be restored to a right relationship with him. As man's creator, he has authority over man and over all things, since he is the source of all things. Man is answerable to his creator. The second item I'd like to point out is God is self-sufficient. Looking at verse 24 and 25, God needs nothing from mankind. God is complete in himself. As Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, there is unity in the Godhead that is beyond our understanding. God did not create man out of necessity for companionship or for any other necessity. <coughs> Revelation tells us that we were created for God's pleasure. So man does not meet a need God has for self-fulfillment, security, or as an object for his affection. Does he love us? Absolutely. Absolutely. Don't you for one second buy into the lie that God doesn't love you because the enemy will try to tell you that lie every day over and over and over again. Oh, you made that mistake. God doesn't love you. Oh, you did that wrong. God doesn't love you. That is a lie from the pit of hell. God does love you absolutely. Does God need you? Absolutely not. God is complete all by himself. Key point there is need. Does he want you? Absolutely. Absolutely. God is complete. He is totally self-sufficient and does not need anything from man. This can be further seen in the next phrase, which shows that while man cannot meet any of God's needs, God is certainly the source of man's needs. He gives life, breath, and everything else to mankind. Verse 25. There is nothing man can give God that God has not already given to man. God is the source. The gifts you have, the talents you have, the wealth you have, the life you have, the health you have, your skills, your abilities, the great hair you have. God gave it to you. It came from Him. We just steward it and we give it back. We give back our talents, our skills, our gifts, our wealth, our life, our time. Furthermore, God is a divine strategist. He has a plan for all of us. We're going to talk a little bit more about that in a couple of minutes. Verse 27, he is not far off from any of us. And this this is one of the most exciting truths in this passage. And I'm going to tell you why. Paul is not even speaking to Christians here. He is speaking to pagan philosophers, the Stoics, and the Epicureans. This is Paul's first major exposition of the gospel to an audience 
without a background of Old Testament, Old Testament theology or Jewish thought. You know, his pattern was to go to the synagogue and preach. And when they didn't listen, he'd go out on the countryside. He preached to the Gentiles and anybody that would listen. Here, he's talking to a bunch of people that they're not even, they don't, what is the Old Testament? What are the Ten Commandments? He's talking to a bunch of philosophers. And to me, that makes it quite interesting. The Stoics were pantheistic, believing that God was in everything. God is all, and all is God. They were opposed to self-indulgence and pleasure. The Epicureans, on the other hand, lived for enjoyment and fulfillment. They did not deny that deities existed, but saw them as very far away and unconcerned about the affairs of man. So Paul tells these people that God set things up so that man would seek him and find him. Although, he's not far off from each of us. Now many today seem to adopt this Epicurean view that God is far off and he doesn't know what's going on in our little world. And he doesn't really care. And so we'll do what we want and whatever makes us feel good. And we look around and our hearts break because our world is broken. God isn't far off, and he does know what's going on in our world. This is what the Bible teaches, and it is consistent with the life experience of the true believer. In Psalms chapter 119, verse 150 and 151, we find this. Those who devise wicked schemes are near, but they are far from your law. Yet you are near, O Lord. All your commands are true. Then in Isaiah 55, verse 6, we read, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. He is not far from anyone here today. All that is needed is a heart that will start looking for him. And you will find him. Another truth about God I, I find in the scripture is that he is more than man's greatest idea of him. Verse 29. Men have made idols of gold and silver. Many of them are beautiful beyond imagination, according to God's, or excuse me, according to man's standards. However, these idols fall so pathetically short of showing what God is like, that God commanded his people not to make idols. Now don't make idols. Only a living being made in God's image can show what God is like. Christians, we have been given that charge. We are here to show the world what God is like. So they may desire to know him for themselves. Let's not limit God by trying to make him in our image. It is unfortunate. A lot of people see in this passage that one day there will be a judge who will bring justice. And we show a lot of judging to the world. We need to be sure that what people see is love. When they see genuine, true love from us for them, they see the creation of man in God's image. I see a God who loved them too. Let's make that our first message. Let's make that the one they remember. 
What else can we learn about the noble God? Well, verse number 30, he has overlooked past ignorance. But now requires repentance. You see, the time for ignorance is past. Now that Jesus the Messiah has come, and the age of the kingdom has come, man may no longer plead ignorance regarding God's requirements. What does he require? He requires repentance from every wrong deed. He requires a change in the posture of our heart, rather than arrogantly thinking we can make it without him. He wants us to humble ourselves before we ask before him and ask him to forgive us for the mess we have made of our lives. We must acknowledge that we need his help. And he will judge the world one day by the man he has raised from the dead. Nobody likes to talk about judgment, however, we lie to ourselves and to those around us and we pretend that God will not judge each and every person who does not call on his name to repentance. See, every person will stand before God and give an account for his or her life. And when that day comes, will you be able to say that you live for Jesus or for yourself? See, according to the Bible, there may be a lot of nice people in hell. Doing a lifetime of good deeds is not enough to earn our way to heaven. We can only get there by trusting in Jesus Christ for what he did on the cross to take away our sins. We err when we think we can earn our way. Who will avoid the judgment? All who believe in Christ. Those who will call on him for forgiveness and salvation. These are some of the truths we find about God in the Bible. He is an awesome God whom everyone will answer to someday. However, in addition to holding people accountable, God wants to hold us close. He wants us close. That leads us to our next main point. God wants closeness with us. Getting close to God is what he wants from us. Looking at verse 26 to 29, from one man he made every nation of men that they would inhabit the whole earth, and he determined the time set for them and the exact places where they should live. God did this so man would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that this divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by man's design or skill. See, God arranged things so that people would try to find him and be able to do so. People in the past have tried to show what God is like by making statues and images. But he cannot be condensed into an image or even into an idea for man. God is too big for that. It's in control. It puts people in the right place at the right time so that they will hear the gospel and have an opportunity to receive them. The enemy tries to thwart his plan, but God is, much, is a much better strategist than Satan is. Satan is clever, but God outclasses him in infinitely in every way. God will have the last word in everything. He is omniscient, knowing everything, and also infinitely wise. And in God's wisdom, he made himself accessible to us. He does want us to seek him and to search for him, but he wants us to find him. He's not far off from each of us. God wants to be found by us. Now please understand, God is not playing games with us, making it difficult for us to find him, just so we can get a kick out of watching us stumble around in the darkness. No, the reason God wants us to do a little seeking for him is because only that which is worth seeking is worth finding. If God just threw himself at us, we may not honor him as the power of the of the universe. But when we become driven by our desire to know our creator and begin to seek him out, knowing 
that without him, we are lost. And then we will find him and honor him for who he is. We will find him when we look for him with all of our heart. Jeremiah 29, 13 says, You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all of your heart. Well, fourth and finally, getting close to God will never happen without this last requirement. See, getting close to God begins with repentance. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He's given proof of all this to men by raising him from the dead. When they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some of them sneered. But others said, we want to hear you again on this subject. At that point, Paul left the council. But a few men became followers of Paul and believed. At this point, Paul lost much of his audience because most of them did not believe in the resurrection. Life after death. Let alone final judgment that required repentance. As soon as Paul starts to talk about the resurrected man who would judge people for doing right and wrong, he received three responses. First, it appears that most of them just wrote him off as kind of crazy or strange to believe that someone could come back to life after dying. The second response was that some people wanted to know more about what Paul had said, but at a later time. The third response was that some people believed what Paul had said about God, who was close and not far away. They repented, being willing to change the things in their lives that were an offense to God, and they started a relationship with God who can be known. Repentance is absolutely necessary if you want to get close to God. It's absolutely necessary if you want to make it to heaven. The reason humans struggle so much is with repentance is because it deals a death blow to our pride. Something inside us dies so that something much greater can live. Who truly enjoys saying, I was wrong? Most of the time, it's, you see, I was right. <laughs> Who really wants to admit, I messed up, I've sinned, and done God wrong? Yet that is exactly what God needs to hear from our mouths and see in our hearts. The New Living Translation has Psalm 51, 17. It says, the sacrifice you want is a broken spirit, a broken and repentant heart, O oh God, you will not despise. See, as I conclude this morning, I, I hope that we are all past the point of caring more about what people think than caring about what God thinks. And what is best for us and for our families. I can tell you today that a relationship with the one true God through Jesus Christ will help you become a better person. It will help you be a better parent to your kids or grandparent. It can help you be a better spouse. It can help you become a better friend. It will improve your quality of life because it always, excuse me, it allows you to deal with the hurts and the disappointments in life. Freeing you to enjoy each day without anger or fear or guilt or other negative emotions that bog you down. It even results in deliverance. There's so many who are bound by addictions and tormented by the enemy. However, one of the greatest things about knowing God is knowing that the future is taken care of. Not only in this life, but in the life to come. So what will your story be? Will you be like some who heard Paul and had no further interest in the things of God? Will you just go on with your life? Or will you be one of those who would like more information about these things 
before you decide how you respond. Or, we be one of those who heard the truth and knew that they needed to make things right with God. You see, I'm not here to coerce you or push you into anything. I'm not trying to sell you anything. But don't let the enemy talk you out of the best thing that you'll ever have in this life or the next. See, I'm not talking about joining a church or religion, but starting a relationship with the living God, the King of the universe. Folks, God wants to be close to you, and he wants you to be close to him. If you already have a relationship with him, I urge you to get closer. Can you bite into a Reese's and not get a bowl of peanut butter and a chocolate? Can you really do that? Is your chocolate at work in the peanut butter of the kingdom? Is God all over you? And somebody can't touch your life without getting peanut butter on the fingers. See, God wants us closer. God's close to you. As close as you want him to be. The question is, how close will you get to him? Is there anything in your life that is keeping Jesus at a distance? Because it's not worth it. Put it in his place. Don't give your heart's affection to anything other than the one who gave his life for you. He loves you. And he wants you to get close to him. Closer than you've ever been. I hope you will take steps to do that today. Would you stand with me as we close in prayer? Uh, this morning we look at your text and we find your truth that you have a desire for us to be close to you. And you're right here. You're not very far off. And I wonder if there's some in this room that have heard the gospel so many times they almost feel like it's a foregone conclusion but they've never responded. You're here this morning. I want you to walk away without making a critical decision. Don't be like the ones that just want to keep God unknown. And don't be like the ones that oh, I can wait. I just need a little more information. Be like the ones who heard the truth. God loves you. He has a plan for your life. And he wants to forgive you of your sins. And that comes through repentance. Faith in Jesus Christ. If that's you this morning, I encourage you as we close in prayer for you to take that critical step. But you might be sitting here going, you know, Pastor, I've been walking with God for a long time. I've been walking with God since television was black and white. <laughs> tell you that God wants you to take a step closer today. And every day that follows, closer and closer and closer. Father, this morning as we go from this place, our hearts cry that we would be close to you.
as we go from here, Lord, I pray that you would just continue to work in us, draw us nearer to you. How we laugh and joke, and we kid about different things like peanut butter and chocolate. God, our desire is that people would see our lives, and as a result, they would taste and see and know the Lord is good. That's how close we want to be with you. We can't help but touch people with your love, your light. Help us to accomplish that today as we go in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Do we have a song? We got a song?